Hello everyone, Dave Lander here from DaveLander.com. This is the week in charts. Obviously, I want to thank all you guys and girls for being here tonight. I appreciate you taking time out of your busy schedules to be here. So what are we talking about? Well, obviously the market, big change today compared to other days. I think we're okay so far though. We'll, we'll get to that in a few minutes. Your questions on trading, if you don't mind, keep them on the slides, just so my ADD doesn't kick in. Your favorite stock picks, if you don't mind, wait until we get to the live charts for that. Ask about them one at a time, that's for your your benefit. So we talk about, well, I want to continue my talk about Darvis. And as I was looking at how I made $2 million in the stock market, his book, that is, and one thing I thought about a lot was that it's really a trader's journey and it's likely a lot like your trader's journey journey, and certainly a lot like my trader's journey. Before we get into all that, there's a flame screen. As you know, you can lose money trading or as I often sum it up, all predictions are about the future and a lot of stuff can happen between now and then. I borrowed that from Greg Morris. So the book again is How I Made Two Million in the Stock Market and I'm not gonna go into a lot of details about his little method and I'm still kind of fleshing out or, or learning, I, sh I should say, a little bit about his method. He wrote a third book, the second book I'll show you in one second, and it's called You Can Still Make It in the Stock Market. And I just started reading. I got it yesterday or day before, and I just opened it up. And in this one, I noticed that he changed his stop to 10%. Now, 10% is better than what he was using, I believe. And unless you're in a rip-roaring bull market like some of his – most of his money was made in, then trying to put your stop right here when the top of the box is bro broken out, more often than not would get hit. As I often preach, breakouts work when markets break out and keep breaking out. And we'll talk a little bit about that. I'm gonna focus mostly though on the trading psychology, the behavioral finance, and some of the other things that Darvis by complete accident backed into and something that we're all a little guilty of and uh, present company included obviously. But anyway, the uh, box top is at high, that's not touched for three days. So you don't know this is the high or the box top until three days later. And you don't know that this is the low until three days later. So this little, put this little blue dotted line in here, just so if you are if you start using them on your own, you'll know that the box hasn't been set for three days. Now he did write Wall Street, the other, Las Vegas, which isn't quite as good as the first book. But there is a lot of the trading psychology and all that comes out in that. And between that and this one here, which is you can still make it in a stock market, I'll probably do a little bit more on Darvis. And then as these boxes unfold in real time, every now and then I'll point them out. If you have been around for a while and coming to some of these presentations, sometimes over the last 20 years, every now and then I'll call a stock a box stock. And by that, I mean, it just tends to go up over a period of time and makes these boxes on top of these boxes. And that came from the my Darvis kick, just for what it's worth, as I've said the last couple of weeks, came from one of you guys calling me up and we're talking about stocks and you asked me about Docu. And I said, well, I see the TKO there. And I went back and looked at my trading service. I did have it listed as a possible setup, but I chose other stocks around that time that were a little bit more volatile, but Obviously, Doc, you would have worked out really nice, and I assuming, I'm assuming it got whacked today. Anyway, Darvis, just a real quick thumbnail. He, by accident, got some shares of stock, and the shares of stock made him $6,000. He got excited about that. He thought that this was an easy gig and everybody should do it, and he danced around the world. And while he danced around the world, he would get cables giving him stock prices, and he came up with his little box method out of a out of a lot of trial and error, and we'll kind of go through that trial and error here. But I showed this in my stock chart show. This is Chewy. This was one of the mystery charts and was actually in the service, as you just saw. And we got in it right around here. I got in actually a little bit later, but right around that price. And you could see it would have broken out of the top of the box here because you've got a high followed by three lower highs are untouched. They, they don't all have to be in succession or anything, but as long as you have three consecutive highs, as he calls it, as he says, that don't touch this high, that becomes the top of the box. 
So this is where we got into the service. And again, I got in there some, sometimes somewhere around there. I try to mimic the trading on the service as much as possible. So it did form another box on top of that box. As you can see, there's a little bit of intersection. His original methodology, he would have gotten stopped out if not on the first day, if it didn't back until soon thereafter. Now with the 10% rule that he has, when I say now, this book was originally written in 1974. So he came up with a 10% parameters then. So with a 10% parameter, he might've been okay with this. And you can see this made another box and broke out just not yesterday, but on Monday or Tuesday, it broke out of the top of the box. Now, ideally, you want the boxes to, in Darvish speak or Darvish words, stack up like pyramids, look kind of like stairs going higher. So the purpose really of this presentation isn't to get so much into his methodology. The point is that breakouts work in breakout markets. And we'll talk about a little bit about an IPO in just one second that it worked out really not, would have worked out nicely with. Although based on his original rules, you would have got stopped out. But the main thing I want to talk about is tonight is his journey and the wisdom that he learned along the way. As I said in prior presentations, I have a few criticisms and complaints or, or just criticisms, I should say. Just things like he put his entire account into one stock, which the book could have easily been titled how I lost two million, how I made and lost two million dollars in the stock market. But there's a lot of things that he a lot of times just kind of backed into. And as you read the book, it's it's uh, it's a worthwhile read. And you can see my I've got uh, highlights and it's dog ear and everything else and lots of notes and everything in it. Somebody borrowed it once and they highlighted it for me. That kind of <laughs> chat me a little bit <laughs> if a couple of people have done that to me i don't know why would you borrow somebody's book and then uh put your own uh notes in it you know, loan some books out before or after that like look <laughs> everything highlighted is not necessarily me anyway uh let the ebb and flow control your portfolio something i learned and keep learning over and over again so darvis said on August 26, 1957, I found myself without a single stock. My automatic stop loss had sold me out of everything. So use stops, let the ebb and flow control your portfolio. And that means that if you get stopped out, you get stopped out. And on the flip side, if you get triggered into stocks, you get triggered into stocks. Sometimes I'll show a stock and it never triggers and then it fails miserably and as i've said on nauseam somebody will email me six months later and say that stock sucks and we argue over whether or not i've recommended it when i realized that i did not all the time because we get in some stinkers every now and then quite often more often than i would like but a lot of times just waiting for an entry will keep you out of trouble and honoring your stop getting out of the way will keep you out of trouble you got to be careful because a lot of times you get stopped out of the stock and then you'll see it go straight back up and it'll really aggravate you. But what you don't realize is how many times you get stopped out of a stock and then it just implodes. And every now and then I'll see one that I was in months ago that's like half or a third of its value. And I'll feel a heck of a lot better about the stock once that occurs. So you have to kind of look at, you kind of have to look at both sides. If you look at the upside, you also have to look at the downside, which you would have avoided. So I went back to the 50s, and this is the date, August 26, 1957. And you could see that that's where he got out. Market was in a bit of a slide for a while. This is S&P 500. And then you can see the big blue arrow continue to point lower after that. Now, it reminded me, and I know I've said this quite a bit before, but it reminded me of 2007 though the market was near new highs i found myself apologizing to my clients that i couldn't find any longs and i don't know where the actual video is but i did find a paper copy of the service right around that time this is when we had already put on three short positions and then we we're looking to have actually establish a fourth one and we'll take a look at that the market around that time in a few minutes and as you can see right here, Nuva, which was our last long, hit the stop on the remaining shares for around three-point gain. And then 
again, we have these shorts, as you can see over here on page two, SLB, ILMN, and LVS. By the way, if you go to DaveLander.com slash archives, you can down all, download all these if you can't sleep at night and study them. And you can see warts and all, what I recommended, what worked, what didn't. And I think it's a great exercise. People are like, can I get a trial of service? I'm like, well, I can give you like 20 years of it if you want to take a look at it. You know. <laughs> so this was the day that I posted that. And the market was just off of all-time highs, as you can see right here. And I just couldn't find a long to save my life, as I often say, and I was setting up with shorts. And then you can see the market had a pretty serious slide afterwards and it rallied up a little bit. And everybody always talks about 2009 being such a bad year. Well, it was late in 2007, 2008, when the market really began to crack. Now, getting back to Darvis, he figured out that the trend is your friend, be a lover not a fighter, which was Leo Melamed. And he also said, well, I, I often say, in fact, I've written, written a column about this. If you can't be in the trend you love, love the trend you're in. George can't hear me. Turn your speakers up, George. George, turn your speakers up. Sounds working on this end. Okay, okay, he's like, knock it off. <laughs> Yeah, it's it's usually pretty robust. If I could see a little bar on this end, I'd do a sound check just in case, but if I could see a bar on this end, I know it's working. So getting along the line, if you can be in a trend you love, love the trend you're in, as I often say, which I think I stole that from, is it Crosby, Stills, and Nash? Anyway, I didn't like the trend, but I knew it was no use trying to fight it. So that's a little bit of Leo Melamed. That's a little bit of love the trend you're in. And then he also came to the wisdom of patience and let the market come to you. And if you read the book, he waited and waited and waited and waited and waited. And he said, so I accepted everything for what it was, not what I wanted it to be. What's the quote about GC Selden? something about being willing to subordinate your will onto the market, something along those lines. I know I've talked about that. In fact, well, I'll put that slide in next week's presentation so that'll make a little bit more sense. So I accepted everything for what it was. How many times do I say what is, is? Not what I wanted it to be. I just stayed on the sidelines and waited for better times to come. How many times when the market is chopping sideways do I preach sit on your hands? And believe me, as we get to some of Darvis's faults, I'm not holier than now. I go through a lot of the same emotions and have to learn and relearn lessons. Money management is key. Use stops. No matter how well built your house is, you would not think of forgetting to insure it against fire. Now, to his credit, he used a really, really tight stop, which again, I have a problem with, or as I've said quite a bit, especially the breakout method, because you get stopped out more often than not. And then I see in his latest book, which was written in 1975, that he went to 10%. The problem with like a straight 10%, it's like a popular method a while back, was super popular in the eighties when I was learning how to trade. First book I read on trading probably, talked about using an 8% stop. Well, if you're trading some of the stocks in my trading service, at least right now, some of them will move 8% in, in 10 minutes. And, and more often than not, you would get stopped out on noise alone. That's why you have to be really careful with a fixed stop. But I'll tell you this, I think his box method would work a heck of a lot better, especially in a bigger cap stock, if you did use a 10% stop. You could certainly use a lot worse methods trying to buy low. And things like that and things of that nature now he also figured out that price action often hints of something the market knows that you don't now he was in diners club a credit card company which i don't know if they still exist or not but i remember seeing diners club as a kid in people's wallets at restaurants and stuff and uh, 
they were a very popular card and in, in the in maybe the only card at the time and the boxes he saw the boxes building in this particular stock and he got into it and then he got stopped out at, at a really really good profit well what he didn't know was american express decided that they were going to launch a card and that pretty much destroyed diners club so he was off in the Far East dancing, and he said, being in the Far East, I could not possibly know of any rival organization being set up. Yet the technical side of my system, based on price action, had warned me to get out. So Darvis did really well when he was traveling the world trading, and he had little cryptic codes because evidently a telegram, or as he calls them, a cable, was very, very expensive. So he used these cryptic codes to where it was hard for anyone else to understand what was going on. And he got questioned a lot with his cables because they were so cryptic. And they just had like some numbers, what he bought, he had abbreviations for the symbols, not even the real symbols. And he would have to explain to the cable operator, or whatever you call the guy, what they were and that he wasn't some sort of spy now you can't let the good times go to your head so he started doing really well and he's like hey let me go to new york and i'm so good at this just think of us in new york as opposed to hong kong or bangladesh and all these other places vietnam i think he mentioned or some other places far off locations he thought, hey, you know, if I went to New York, I could probably be a heck of a lot better at this. Well, you can't let it go to your head. And all of this had a deadly effect on me. It was as if the get rich quick demon had gotten a hold of me. I completely lost the clear perspective I had so carefully built up through my cables. He would get his little cable, he'd follow his little cable, he'd place his order, he'd send a cable back to the broker. Then he would go off and do his little dance or whatever. In fact, he would say, don't send me a cable until seven o'clock at night because he slept all day as a dancer because he performed at night. Step myself, I led myself along a path where I began to lose my skill. How often do we do really, really well trading and then everything kind of comes off the rails? a little bit anybody guilty well i'm pretty guilty i've chased a few rabbits this year as i've admitted lately now along those lines the same thing happened with livermore livermore traded in the bucket shops and did extremely well and he could beat them at their game and he had to put on disguises at one point to go into bucket shops and they would recognize him because either not so much because the disguise was poor but they would see that there was only one guy in the whole bucket shop that was making money. To, to those who don't know, a bucket shop is a, they had these little brokerages called, and they called them bucket shops, because what they would do is they would take your order and they wouldn't actually send it to New York. They would give you a timestamp on it and say, okay, you've got IBM at $100 a share. You got 10 shares at $100 a share, whatever the case may be, and slide your ticket back. Well, they knew that the psychology of you would probably not win and you would end up losing on the trade so they wouldn't have to pay you out of their till and they also allowed you to use a lot of margin which helped you to blow up even quicker so they were they would kind of churn you in and out but livermore beat them at their game because livermore was a used to write his job was to take a piece of chalk as a kid and write the prices of stocks on the stock board in a bucket shop, I guess, or a brokerage. And through the process, he learned how to read the tape. Now, Darvis did really well when he was far away from Wall Street. He was unemotional. He didn't get caught up in the rumors. He didn't get caught up in watching the tape. And back then, it was an actual piece of tape, right? Somebody, I didn't pick the cover of my of layman's, but somebody made fun of it it's like uh it's it's a good book it's by the stupid cover that's there's a stock ticker on the front of it i i, I didn't i didn't care what they put on it 
I behaved like a complete amateur. The careful system I had built up collapsed around me. Instead of blaming my own stupidity, I invented different reasons for my failures. He got caught up with other traders and it almost seemed like he was day trading and over trading. And you know, any of us guilty of that? Yeah, I've done a little bit too much of that this year and I've backed off and I've got my life back again and focused on the trend and that's where the real money is. So the wheels sort of came off the bus with him and markets don't beat traders, they beat themselves. Now I know that it was caused by my egotism leading to vanity, leading to overconfidence, which in turn led to disaster. It was not the market that beat me, it was my own unreasoning instincts and uncontrolled emotions. When you read about his journey here, especially the psychological part of his journey, you could see where a lot of these markets, like a lot of these market quotes come from. This could be the genesis of quite a few of them, such as you don't, the markets don't beat you, you beat yourself. You have no control over the market. The only thing you can't control is yourself. So he got a little too caught up. There was too much action going on when he was in New York. And as I've talked about before, he had a little acrasia happen to him. Acrasia is foregoing your future self, just kind of like forget it, but you know, just not doing what you want today, being undisciplined, thinking that, well, I'll get disciplined in the future. Okay, I'm gonna go on a diet next week. I really am, I swear to God, I am. <laughs> I had a health scare earlier this week, which was, uh, it was really bad, you know? So uh, we'll have to, it's a two drink minimum on that one, but it, everything turned out okay. It was just a fluke, but it was it was a uh, touch and go there for a while. So. I almost, uh, you know, it was, it, was get, it was like get your life in order type of thing. But we'll talk about that someday. Maybe we'll have a retreat and we'll uh, we'll have two drink minimum stories. But anyway, acrasia is, is sort of a not doing what you should do in the moment. And you're stealing from your future self. And one way to avoid acrasia, and I've talked about this quite a bit. And I think I first heard the word acrasia from one of the Kirk reports. So Charlie Kirk, I'll give him credit for that. I get a lot of good stuff from Charlie Kirk for what it's worth. And I kind of took the ball and ran with it. I did a lot of research on Acrasia and read a few books uh, that, that talked a lot about it. And I'm trying to think of the guy's name. I think it's the guy from Atomic Habits uh, talked about Acrasia, and that's who Charlie Kirk was referencing. But if you look at my website, A-K-R-A-S-I-A, -A -A, I think you do a search on that, and you should get some articles. And behind the members area, we talk about it quite a bit, or I talk about it a lot of bit. I should say. My first move in New York was to erect an iron fence around myself to ensure that it did not repeat any of my previous errors. So he began to sort of commit to commitment devices. I know of one trader who's a pretty good scalper and he likes to scalp around the open, but he's also a doctor and he's a pretty busy doctor. And he's figured out that if he can't make money in the first 30 to 45 minutes of the day, he's not going to make money for the rest of the day. And he's also figured out that if he does make money in those first 30 to 45 minutes, more often than not, he gives it up the rest of the day. So he's figured out that's that sweet spot, amateur hour, some people call it. But if you're, you're a nimble scalper, you can go in and, and do it. It's not my forte. I, I, that's something that's kind of like Mr. Darvis said earlier, he kind of got caught up in excitement. Well, this a few months ago, I kind of got caught up in his scalping excitement and find my, found myself doing a little bit and I failed miserably. And it's all the things I practice, all the things I preach, I wasn't practicing. Like, don't be so close to the markets. Don't watch every little flickering tip, tick, uh, a term I got from David Keller. And I need to find out, he sent me an email on who the guy was, but I keep forgetting. Anyway, I'll clarify that. But long story endless, this scalper or client slash friend slash doctor, what he would do is he would scalp for 30 minutes to 45 minutes, and then he'd, he would go see patients. But before he would go see patients, he would hand his phone off to his secretary, and she would change the password to his trading account 
and hand it back to them. <laughs> and that's how, that's the commitment device that stopped him from day trading the rest of the day. And I, I know of a lot of other commitment devices that people have done to protect themselves from themselves. I, I know a trader was getting a little doughy. I mean, I'm getting pretty doughy. I'm, I'm going to work on that. I swear. I always say that. I know, but I will. I'll meet it this time. Anyway, he his commitment device was he found a young kid that really liked to work, work out and didn't have a lot of money. And he said, look, I'll pay your gym. I'll pay your gas. And if I'm not on his front porch at 6 a.m., waiting for you to pick me up every day, then I'll give you $20. And that kid was in his driveway at five to six every day, hoping that he wouldn't show up at six sharp. So that was a commitment device. So there's a lot of things we need to do to protect ourselves from ourselves. And if you go and watch some of those presentations on Acrasia, I talk about that quite a lot. So in committing to his commitment devices, one thing he realized was ignore the news and just focus on price. I tear out the pages so he would get barons and he would tear out the pages giving me the day's quotations and throw away the rest of the financial commentaries however well informed they might lead me astray so focus on price and only price as i preach news is noise ignore the news doesn't mean that news doesn't affect prices but you can't trade off of it unless you're doing like an opening gap reversal off the news. Okay, any questions, thoughts, or comments on Darvis? I think that the the my takeaway from this again is that he went through the sort of same trader's journey that we, that we all go through, and he learned and relearned lessons. And I think we're we're all human. We all have emotions, and sometimes we learn and relearn a lot of lessons, and it can be quite painful. Now, last week and in my stock charts show on filmed on Tuesday and published on wednesday which was yesterday i think it's weeks of blur i talked about crypto being the next big thing and it was the last big thing also ipos too and if you go in and watch last week's week of charts i also talked about it too and ethereum and link and bitcoin were all set up very nicely well link has kind of failed, I wouldn't say miserably, but anytime I'm in a position it goes against me, I, I'm miserable. So miserably so far, but I think it still has potential. And this is the ACP plugin from stockcharts.com. And it just counts the number of days the lows are greater than the moving average. In this case, I've got it set to, or have it set to a 30-day EMA. And as you know, if you've been around for a while, you know, with my market timing, I'll use a 50-day simple moving average and look at a weekly chart, so a 50-week moving average, and use the same sort of concept. But one thing that I've been playing with a lot lately is this Landry light and the pullbacks to the moving average. Now, it doesn't actually touch the moving average here, but it comes close enough for government work to take the trade. And I took this trade, but you can see it rallied out the pullback. If you were to get back into this one, I would wait or get into it to begin with. I would wait to see if it could take out this little pivot high in here. But my thinking with this Landry light is that if you have 10 or more days, and this comes from my second book, I called it, what did I call it? Linda Rasky calls it the Holy Grail. She uses ADX for trend. I just simplify that a little further. And I just use a moving average for trend. In the book, I use a 20-day EMA, which you could. Lately, though, it seems like markets have been so volatile and some of these go-go stocks have gone so far and so fast. I've preferred a little bit deeper pullback, and that's why I've been using the 30-day EMA with this. And by the way, I see, as I preach, I see an indicator as an illustrator. Indicators don't indicate anything, okay? They tell you what's happened in the chart. So if you're just looking at this chart, it's like, oh, it looks like a rally. It looks like a pullback come down here and it's like, oh, okay, yeah, we had this Landry light and then we have no Landry light, okay? And if you're new to the Landry light on the downside, see this little high back here? Notice that you have one little red bar there. This counts the number of bars, not the magnitude, the number of bars. And you could set, this little thing is set to 40 here. Usually I'll pull that down to about 10, okay? So 10 would be right, right here. 
So as soon as you have 10 days of Landry Light, pick your favorite moving average, exponential, simple. I like the, 12, the 30 exponential for this, which is one of the bow tie moving averages for those keeping score. And I didn't, I didn't know about this crypto. I wish I would have because I would have doubled my money in it or maybe even tripled my money. Look at that, all the way up to 21. A tiny elf is coming out. Look at that trend, it's huge. <laughs> So I can't really, I can't find any tiny Elvis videos. You guys find some, let me know. I've been looking. It's, it was an old SNL skip. But you can see it's had a nice run again, nice little pullback. And so far, again, it hasn't worked for me. Maybe my entry was a little too aggressive, obviously. But I think there's still hope. So I haven't given up completely. The Bitcoin and the Ethereum don't look, the Ethereum looked great a couple days ago, but they look a little bit more questionable now. And we could take a look at those cryptos if we have time after we get through the markets. Now, this is a, a chart I showed in my stock chart show, one, two, three, four, five days before we look to trade any IPO. The earliest we will get in is a close of day five. So as I preach, if a IPO comes public on Monday, the earliest we will possibly enter that IPO will be the close on day five. In this case, you can see the high was set for the week on day two. Well, we don't care what day the high is, as long as day two, day three, or day four, the high is greater than day one. If the high, if the high is set on day one, then your buy would be above that high. So this high was up here, your buy would be above that high. But because the high was not set on day one, it would be a new closing high. And I've talked about this pattern quite often. And if you're a member of DaveLander.com, you can get the IPO stuff from behind a firewall. But I just wanna show you a Facebook post. This is John's post, John Ross. He's very active in the Facebook group. We have a bunch of good traders in the group, by the way. Group's free, but you have to be a member of DaveLander.com. You have to be a gold member, which means you have to be a paying member. And that's the lowest level of gold. And then platinum would be, you'd, also on the trading service, but anyway, and that's just to keep the riffraff out. And I know I kind of joke about that, but I've been parts of a lot of forums and even professional forums to my surprise. And as I often joke, it kind of becomes a Lord of the flies really quick. But so far this group has just been phenomenal, been very excited. So closing high would be the entry on this one and not a whole lot happened for a while. Now notice it penetrated that closing high a few times. This isn't a trigger type of situation where you're buying on a stop or something, kind of like Darvis box breakout. But what we're doing is we're buying on the close. So this is where I actually bought in on this one. And I like to show you that I actually took the trade. And I think I have the trade in here somewhere. But I sold half of it on that particular day there. Oh, there's a trade, okay. So I usually just try to grab the trades out of one account, which would be a representative sample of the model account, which is a 100K account. Anyway, as you can see, so I sold half at that particular on that particular day there. And the reason I wanted to show you this IPO again, there's another reason, which I'll show you in one second. But I want to show you that IPOs do have a bit of a breakout characteristic to them. Now I did a little backing and filling, as you can see, but that's okay. You have to be willing to take a little heat on any trade and it really didn't do anything wrong it just consolidated before it took off again now this is what i wanted to show you so yesterday or actually yeah it was yesterday i came in and it gapped higher i'm feeling pretty good and then it starts dropping and dropping and dropping and dropping and dropping and i got to thinking that you know i don't want to give up all those open profits even though it took half of my profits I feel like I want to take something home on this. The market has been so volatile lately. IPOs have been so volatile lately. You know what? I'll get stopped out. I'll get stopped out. At least I'll stop out of the profit. And then I can go on and find another IPO. Or maybe it'll keep pulling back and set up. And so I was looking at how much I was down when this close here was down around here because the market was still open. And I said, let me just get out of the market. That way I still have a little profit left. And I said, no, Dave, just put in a hard stop right below the market. You get stopped out and you get stopped out. And as soon as I put it in, the market began to drop. And I just assumed I was stopped out. I literally, 
I literally took it off my quote screen because I thought I was stopped out. And when I checked back in the other account where I placed a trade, I was surprised that I was still in it. And not only was I still in it, the stock was five, almost five and a half points higher than where I nearly sold out. So the lesson I learned or relearned there is put a stop, even if you want to get out of a market, go ahead and put a hard stop in and let that market take you out. Now today, same sort of action to start selling up hard. And ironically, it stopped right around the same place. And I just reclicked the order or resubmitted it for 32 down was pretty darn close to 32. And luckily, I didn't get stopped out and bounced back about two points. Now, it doesn't mean it won't get stopped out tomorrow. Obviously, you could gap down tomorrow and take you out. But hopefully, and I hate to use the word hope in this business, but hopefully this is a good example of letting the market make the decision for you. So if I just said, well, right around here or whatever, like, you know, I better get out. I don't want to lose all my open profits. I want to have something to take home, right? I'd have been pretty aggravated when it's four or five points higher by the end of the day. Whereas this way, if I put it a hard stop, it gets stopped out, it gets stopped out, okay? So just an FYI on that. And a lot of people will often ask me when they get into a bunch of stocks that they probably shouldn't be in. And, and I think it's good advice. And, and obviously it's, it's up to them to make their own decisions. But what I tell them is, look, you've been holding this thing for six months, even though it's it hasn't done well. Instead of just exiting everything willy-nilly, you've held it this long, just put a stop in place, tight stop, not, not a liberal, liberal stop, but a tight stop in place and let the market take you out of that position. If you've got six or seven of these lying around, then put six or seven stops in and you might get lucky and, and one might take off. So just a kind of a an FYI on that. And it's one thing I try to do as opposed to jumping in and out of the market. I try to enter on a stop most of the time and I try to exit on a stop most of the time. All right, if you are a gold member of DaveLandry.com, make sure you join the Facebook group on my to-do list. I keep writing every day, go through everyone and make sure everyone that's a gold member is in the Facebook group. That's so far, I mean, I'm pretty excited about all the videos I have behind the firewall and all the things that I've done. And I really think it's some really good training and a lot of people have gone through it and they're really happy with it. But I think the real value is being part of this group where you have a lot of traders because you know trading can be a pretty lonely sport and it's fun to interact with the other guys and see what they're doing and and you know i brought up a couple of stocks that i actually was thinking about in the past and and they kind of picked them apart a little bit and i wasn't offended i'm like you know what you guys are right and, and you saved me from a bad trade so it it goes both ways and i and like today i just noticed uh i was craig earlier was answering somebody craig w and it's like it's exactly what I would have said. So, so a lot of guys in the group, very familiar with my philosophy and I appreciate you guys chiming in. But anyway, you can interact with other traders. You can ask for help and newbies are fine. You know, if you want to come in, if you're a newbie, we'd love to have you. Again, you got to be a gold member, DaveLander.com. And occasionally I'll put out some signs and signals and talk about things like IPOs there. Okay, all right, let's go ahead and shift gears. If you want to start asking about individual stocks, feel free to do so now. Let me get my chart shared and then we'll take a look at the overall market. We'll take a look at your favorite stock picks. And then if you guys want to look at Bitcoin or any other markets, I have uh, ACP up in the background and we'll take a quick look at those markets. Let's start off with the P's. Now, I don't have my screen up and ready to go, but I do a lot of volatility work, as you know. In fact, maybe I could boot it up in the background. Let me do that. Let me get this boot in the background. And I've been talking about this volatility work quite a bit going back a few months. And one of the things I noticed that notice is that the volatility had dropped way off in the S&P 500. Now, some of that is due to this persistency of this move higher that we've had as of late. But also notice the range has decreased too. Now, historical volatility, which I'm using, does not actually use range as part of the calculations. But if I can get this up in the background, I also have a lot of other indicators in here that use the range. So let me just see if that'll boot. Yeah, it's booting. Okay, let me uh, switch over real quick to show you what I'm working on or have been working on for quite a while. 
yeah, keep the stock picks coming. The more we have, the more the merrier. So my point in doing this, and this is the first time I pulled it up tonight, but what I'm doing here is, if you go back in about a month or so ago, I explained what each one of these little things are. And if you could get an HG day, a holy grail day, okay? Now you don't know it while it's unfolding, but if you could look at certain things that'll get you closer to an HG day, for instance, I programmed a little indicator up here, which tells you how many days since there was an HG day. So coming into today and yesterday, I knew it was good days to be trading the E minis because the market was due to have a trend day. A trend day is when it starts at one end and sells off hard. Now, my HG days, it doesn't have to close at the low, but I have a program as long as they the open is within 90% of the high of the day or the open is within 90% of the low of the day, okay? And uh, it has a wide range bar. So yesterday was a wide range bar. Yesterday was a good day. I did okay in the S&Ps yesterday. I did so-so today. I was a little nervous about putting on size and holding given the nature of the market. But what I'm doing here, and again, I, I don't want to spend a whole lot of time walking you through this because I've done it before in, in prior presentations. But the point is that I'm measuring various true ranges up here. I'm measuring the actual range. And I'm looking at these things to see where we are, to see what the volatility of the market is. I'm also looking at 20-day highs and 20-day lows, which are these dotted lines in here. And my goal is to try to predict when this HG7 is likely to occur and mostly sit on my hands or try to sit on my hands and let the market find its way until that HG7 day occurs. Now, let me show you the volatility screen that I use. screen being an actual screen, computer screen. So what I've done here is I've put in a bunch of volatility readings down here. We've discussed this quite a bit going back in the weekend charts. And these are the, the most common one I use is the 50 day HV. And then I put some other volatility readings in here too, going all the way down to like a three day. And what you'll find is volatility gets really, really extreme right around the bottom of the market. Little difficult to time directly off of that. You could probably get yourself in a lot of trouble. But when you see that volatility go whack like that, you know that it could be coming to the end of that downtrend, or at least there's a pretty serious bounce in the works. The other thing I look at is the ratio, and I borrowed a lot of this research from Larry Connors, and I think he got it from Sheldon Nadenberg. And I don't know if I have that book nearby, but it's volatility and option pricing or something like that. And he talks a lot about volatility. And I fell in love with volatility for quite a while. I've always been a momentum guy, but I really got into volatility really heavily. And as I've said in prior presentations, it could be a bit of a rabbit hole and you gotta be really careful with it because it, it does look like butter sometimes. But anyway, the point I really wanna get to to show you tonight, not all these different little fancy indicators or anything. The point I wanna show you is when this HV gets really low, the short term versus the long term. So I'm using a 650 ratio and I also have a 550 in here. All this means is you're taking the six day volatility and divided by the 50 day. So the six day volatility, I forget which line it is down here, but let's just assume it's this black line. That's probably what it is. Divided by the longer term volatility, and that gives you a ratio. So whenever that ratio drops below 50, 50%, 50 you know that volatility is due to revert to its mean. Now, again, you can see it's kind of hard to time off of it. But the one thing I was thinking in the P's is, and we'll get back to telechart. So obviously you can see that it was low here. Just remember that before everything skyrocketed today. Okay. So the short term volatility, super, super duper low. You see it all down here. Let me see if we can zoom in a little bit more for you. So notice how low all these short term readings were. So that means that the volatility is compressing on a very short term time frame, and it's due to revert back to the mean, and which it did 
in a big way today. It actually started yesterday. Now, the scenario that I was thinking, which would be a cool scenario, painful, but cool. And I think I said this, if you go in and watch the final bar, I was on Wednesday's show. My days are all messed up right now. I think I was on Wednesday's show. And I talked about this scenario unfolding. And I was surprised to see the, the volatility expand to the upside first. And I guess, as somebody once said, and I got, I got this from Linda Rasky, and I'm not sure, I asked her where she got it. She said, probably on a floor somewhere. But the market will do what it has to do to cause the most pain to the most amount of people. And a corollary, which I also got from Linda, is that the market will do the most obvious thing in the most unobvious manner. So that means that if it's going higher, it's going to have a big shakeout first. Now, the point I'm trying to get to here, and believe it or not, I do have one, is that the volatility began to expand a little bit to the upside. You see this wide range bar we had yesterday. So, and then you had a fake out here. So the scenario I was hoping for was volatility expand in a big way to the downside to kind of shake out everybody a little bit and then go back up. So this is a TKO trend knockout. In fact, this is a textbook TKO. I would never give direct trading advice, although in the service I do give direct recommendations, but they're kind of more like suggestions, you know, do what you want, okay? I'm not registered, at least not anymore as anything. But if you're trading like the spiders, I would say, you know what? Put in an entry right above this high. You get triggered. Put in a stop right below that low. Take the measurement of that, broadcast that up here, and that would be your initial profit target. Trail at this amount if it keeps going in your favor, and especially once it hits that initial profit target, I should say if it hits initial profit target, then let that stop widen out. So you have a beautiful, beautiful, beautiful time to get into the market if you missed this whole trend or half of this trend all the way up. Remember, as a trend follower, obviously you'll be a little late. We probably didn't start buying until around June. I did a presentation on that earlier this year. So you can go in and dig that up. And you can find these, most of these you should be able to find on my website. If you're a member, they're a little easier to find because a lot of them are behind the firewall. After a period of time, they go back behind the firewall. Anyway, so what the market did to cause the most amount of pain and the most amount of people was it took off yesterday. It gapped higher and took off. So anybody who did not buy the stock market from April on and keeps telling himself, if this thing keeps going up, I'm gonna have to get in. They got suckered in yesterday and then this TKO comes along and knocks them out. So remember TKO, everything I do has a psychological backing to it. So the TKO, what happens? It knocks out the Johnny come latelys, those without a lot of staying power, those emotional traders that tend to jump in at all costs right at the end of a big trend, just jump in main, main, uh, midstream, easy for me to say. So those guys got knocked out. The shorts who have been poo-pooing this rally forever, when this thing began to crack today, they just piled on it, okay? So now you got the giant come lately kicked out and you've got the Schwartz sucked in. So if you get a trigger on this, I think we would see some really nice highs and a really nice continuation of the trend. If we don't get a trigger on it, then that would mean something different. That would be a completely different conversation altogether. And hopefully we don't have to have that conversation. Now, what's interesting is, and let me see this if this will work. I changed my keys earlier, and now I forget which key it was. Is it F12? Yeah, F12, okay. What's interesting is we didn't even make it to the 30-day EMA, okay? So this market could have quite a bit of ways to go. It could go beyond a 30-day EMA as far as I'm concerned. I mean, I wouldn't like it. I might drop some F-bombs. Where's my F-bomb? Easy to get to. Mike Peterson, the guy in the group gave me this. It's a it's an F-bomb. Let me see if I can see that, see it on camera. And it was funny because when they dropped it off, the package person threw it. 
on my porch and I'm like in the kitchen, you know, eating or something. Imagine that, me eating. And I was in there, boom. I'm like, oh crap, what the hell? <laughs> and I walk outside and there's a box. And I'm thinking, oh, did drunk Dave send me something? You know, did sometimes I might have a few cocktails and if my wife goes to bed, it's like, eh, I don't feel like going to bed just yet. Maybe I'll send myself a little gift. And I'm like, I don't think I was that drunk last weekend, you know? Anyway. So I was a little hesitant to open it, but inside it, I found a little F-bomb and, and I love it. And I keep it on my desk and it reminds me, stop being so emotional in your trading. NASDAQ Composite, same sort of action there. Beautiful, 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 beautiful TKO. Uh, you probably want to party with me. When I see a pattern like this, I just get excited because it's such a textbook pattern. I don't, I hate to use the word hold, but if this thing triggers and takes out that high, I think it's going to go a lot higher for a while, at least enough to get some some money off the trade. At least as much as it went down today, what's that? 600, wow, 600 points in the NASDAQ. I didn't even realize that. I was so busy looking at the futures today, down 130 points. I didn't even realize 150 points at one point, I think. I didn't even notice the NASDAQ. That's like a Dow number, huh? Look at that. That's crazy. Look, look at that. Look at that down. Look at that knockout bar. It's huge. So anyway, I think... Six months from now, a year from now, two years from now, I'm going to be using this as an example of a textbook TKO. And you go, you guys that are nice enough to come every week and be like, stop talking about that textbook TKO. Russell 2000. Well, it got whacked like everything else, right? It did pull back to its 30-day EMA, as you can see. Not the end of the world. A bit of a bummer because we took out the bottom of this trading range here. But I wouldn't count it down and out just yet. Let's just see how things shake out. Gold, the commodity, a little bummed out because gold did not get a flight to safety today. I usually like to see when a market getting cream, I usually like to see a flight to safety. And that just didn't happen, unfortunately, in gold. Now, let's take a look at some of these areas in here. Gold, these stocks down a little bit like gold, the commodity. I think gold looks okay longer term. We're kind of hovering around this 30-day EMA. And if we have time, we'll pull that up in a couple of these markets up in the ACP platform. This is silver, the silver stocks. They haven't even corrected down to their 30 EMA. I'm a silver bug and a gold bug. I've got to watch that because I'm a little buy. I'm a biotech bug too. But speaking of biotech, biotech's a bit of a bummer. I'm going to have to believe in what I see and not in what I want to believe, okay? So you can see biotech is bow tied down, like I told my service peeps tonight. It's a little sloppy, but it's a bow tie nonetheless, and now it's in downtrend proper water. In fact, when we get to the, it probably wouldn't hurt to fire up this in ACP too. So I'll do that. And just one second before we get to the live charts. Health services broke out just yesterday, came all the way back in today, but so far kind of still up here at these nice little high levels right around the base. Transportation came in fairly hard, but as you can see, nice longer term uptrend remains intact there. Semiconductors, another TKO. That looks fantastic, right? Still, I think. Has it even, has it even oops, stupid my tongue. Has it even made it to the uh some water in my mouth. <laughs> Hasn't even made it to the 30-day EMA. So as you go through these sectors, I'm not going to bore you and go through all of them. I know too late, right? But most of them at or near new highs and most of them kind of forming knockout moves. No big shocker there with the overall market making a knockout move itself. Let's take a look at bonds. Bonds are off their worst levels, but they were up a little, oh, sorry, off their best levels. They were up a little bit today. Bonds still look a little suspect. I wouldn't rush out and try to trade them. But as you can see, they have bow tied down. Kind of a pretty pretty clean looking bow tie. As you can see, nice little pivot there from these recent highs, which is right around the prior highs, not too far from, I think that was all time highs back there. Let's take a look at the dollar. I am long the euro, not in a big way. Okay, I'm not that deformed, but just kind of doing some trend following moron stuff. This looks like the dollar is headed in which direction? Down. Okay, and euro is a general statement headed higher. So keep the stock picks coming. Let's just do this real quick. Let's just hop over here to ACP. I'm going to look like I'm an ACP salesman. I just like it because it's fun. 
I know you don't party with me, right? <laughs> so here's the peas. As you can see, we still have lots and lots and lots of Landry light. We got 40 something days. And that just means the lows again are greater than the moving average. What did I want? To, oh, I what I wanted to do in the P's was I wanted to add in the bow ties, okay? And then on top of the bow ties, I need to get them to change the colors on this, but we'll just leave them at that for now. I wanted to add in proper water. So proper water is another little tool you can use to help keep you on the right side of the trend. And this is the same thing similar to the Landry light. And all we're doing is we're counting the number of days the moving averages are in proper order, meaning that the 10 simple is greater than the 20 exponential and the 20 exponential is greater than 30 exponential, okay? This one up here is Landry light. That just means the lows are greater than the 30. Excuse me, getting hungry. So if we back this chart out a little bit, let's go back to like two years. You could see that it's mostly green with the Landry light. When you've got nice, nice, nice uptrends, what happens when the SHTF, okay? The, it turns red, okay? So you have downside Landry light and notice your proper order. When it chops around, what happens with proper order, okay? Well, it goes back and forth from a green to red and a little yellow in between. So this is kind of a fun indicator because it flips back and forth. Let me see if you can make it red to the downside. My poor programmer is going to shoot me. So that's the proper order down here, which is useful, quite useful. And then I've been really getting into this Landry light. That's been kind of fun as of late. So let's just get rid of that. And then we'll take a look at We'll get rid of the bow ties for now and we'll get rid of proper order. Oh, uh, you know what? Let's let's look at something really cool. So here's the spiders. So let's take a look at two days of the spiders. And then let's take a look at, and that some of this I'm just doing on a fly. I haven't really studied it, but I know what happened today. So watch this. This is a five minute bars. Let's look at two days, five minute bars. Look at this, okay? This is a 30 EMA. Now, obviously, you don't know the true number right around the open, but as as the chart fills in. But look at this upside yesterday, okay? That was that was a trend day to the upside, and that was a beautiful run higher, okay? Now, what do we have today? Look at this. Never did touch the moving average until late, late, late in the day. Landry light to the downside. So this is a five minute chart. So I'm a nerd, but I get excited when I look at a market and see like, okay, if it's green, I want to be long. If it's red, I want to be short. And if it's green and red and green and red, green and red, I want to sit on my hands. Can it be that simple? Yes. But not every day looks like today and yesterday, unfortunately. And that's why I do all that volatility research to try to position myself to only trade on those days. And if it's some other type of day, where it's just chopping around, even if it's it could be like a day like this, and I may have gotten chopped up a little bit. I don't want to make it look like I don't get chopped up sometimes because you'll get really chopped up in something like the S&P futures. I have a love-hate relationship with them. A lot of times I love them and they hate my account. But if you could say, okay, well, I might be close to a, 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 um, a trend day, but the market is just chopping back and forth with the Landry light down here or the bow tie proper order will be another good little tool to use down here. Let's just do that real quick. Yeah, so you can see it's red, it's yellow, it's green. It kind of goes back and forth. The Landry light looks like it does a little bit better job in that particular day. But anyway, if you get bored, play around with these. I love the fact that you could just grab this thing and pull it back and forth. This is a uh, something I never thought about but it's real choppy back here okay kind of consolidating you got some green and you get some yellow you got a little bit of red and then look all this green in here so i know i'm a nerd but this is this is cool stuff and again this is not indicating anything this is just telling you what already happened okay and anybody who says they have a leading indicator is is fos all right so any of the markets let me just let's take a look at the crypto real quick and i'll try not to drop an f-bomb <laughs> 
Oh, mother father. I was joking, but look at that. I probably just got stopped out. But that still looks pretty good, guys. That's kind of a TKO within a pullback. That's a that's a pretty cool pattern. So maybe your entry on like the link can come come down in considerably. I should never look at a live trade in the middle of a presentation. <laughs> All right, let's get back to telechart and let's take a look at your stock picks. All right, VUSI, VUZI. Yeah, I mean, this needs to be in your momentum list and I'm sure it's in my momentum list because it's making new highs, but only on a pullback and it's gonna have to break out, continue to break out and then pull back. So yeah, Gary, keep that on your list, A-L-L-Y. Uh, yeah, it's not really that sound like Lucy, huh? Eh, it hasn't really broken out just yet. I mean, classical technical analysis would call that a what do they call it? An asymmetrical triangle. But I would let it break out. And if it does break out and set up, it's got a lot of overhead supply back here. I think you could find something better. I mean, with this SP just looking fantastic, okay. You should be able to find something a little bit better trend with with a beautiful little knockout move like that, given the nature of this market, especially if you pull back a little bit further. So yeah, Ally could be on your watch list, but I think you could probably find a little bit better. T F F P. Yeah, this looks fantastic. It's got okay volume. The I did see this one. The only thing that I would like to see, and it's okay as it is, don't get me wrong. I would like to see a little bit more pullback given the volatility the of the move. The volatility is 91 on the HV, which I have right here. It's accelerated higher. It just looks fantastic. Now, remember, we looked at biotech a few minutes ago. What's going on with biotech? Biotech is not looking so hot. Now, I am kind of a biotech bull, and I've been a biotech bull on and off forever. But as long as it's headed lower, you're going to have to find a really, really, really good looking setup. And this is a really, really good looking setup, George. It just needs to pull back a little bit further. And that's why I didn't recommend this stock tonight. Okay. NGD didn't, did really well today. NGD. That's going to be a gold stock, isn't it? Yeah, look at that. So we got a little breakout in NGD. Why do I know this stock? I think it was long back here somewhere. I don't know why I got shaken out. But yeah, uh, good eye, Craig. And it's got a few little issues longer term, but for the most part, that looks pretty good. So make sure you have that on your watch list. We're not trading the little Darvis box, although it would have broken out of that box, right, today, because then your box top would be here, your box bottom would be down here. So yeah, it would have been a buy based on that. And if gold kicks it back into gear, you could see a pretty good run here. Are you already long, Craig? But yeah, on a pullback, absolutely. You know, um, what's in the Landry list? I can't mention it, but there's there's one that's a little bit better looking than that that's set up actually going in tomorrow. This looks fantastic. The only thing I'd like to see is a little bit more pullback, okay? So George, good eye on that one. I would give you a high five. I think that's the second, sec two out of three you've given me, I really liked, but it just needs a little bit more of a pullback. The HV is a little bit low. I've been finding better opportunities lately in higher HV stock, but hey, here's the deal. The market itself, the HV has dropped to about 15. So I think I'm gonna have to go a little deeper and further into my scans. In fact, lately I've been dropping below 30, okay? Craig says, been in it for a while. You suggested NGD a while ago. It was a mortgage the house trade. <laughs> yeah, when somebody mentions a stock that I'm already long, I, uh, I jokingly say, mortgage the house. Uh, Take your kids' college funds, put all your money in it. And well, I should have taken my own advice on that one. Uh, Dave, this is being recorded and will be emailed out. It will be recorded and on Friday in the newsletter, they will be a, there will be a link to it. If you need to take a nap between now and then and you need something to help you fall asleep, then check my website. I do post it to the website and then it'll find its way into the newsletter. All right, CSIQ, that's going to be a solar stock if memory serves. Yeah, Donald, that looks fantastic. Uh, again, needs a little bit more pullback, but that's okay. I mean, this is a great thing. What sucks about today is that I'm heavily long and I started getting knocked out of some of my great momentum positions. What's great about today is the momentum 
trades you missed, such as CSIQ and some of those other ones that George and others were bringing up, can still be viable now that they, once they pull back a little bit. So let's take a look at UTZ, excuse me for a second. Let's take a look at UTZ, that's gonna be UTS. I wonder if this is the UTS from New Orleans. They make some great chips. I This one's caught my eye. I think this one's on tonight's Landry list. If it is, I apologize for talking about it, but I'm pretty sure it is. Um, I, I like it. It had a base that went on forever, took off and pulled back. It's a good looking stock. I, I almost like a tiny bit more pullback, but that's a good looking stock. And that's a very interesting stock. It's a, I think it's, if, if it's the same thing, if I'm thinking of it, it's a food stock. But yeah, absolutely. That looks fantastic. Boog. Yeah, you know, that's going to be S&P growth. Well, you know, why not just trade the S&P? And if you're going to, go after that on a day trade basis. But yeah, I hear you. It's a little, looks like it's a little bit stronger than the S&P, huh? Look at that. Look at, look at that trend, it's huge. Yeah, good eye there, Gary. So yeah, if you, instead of trading the S&P, volume's a little thin, it's ETF though, you can get away with that. So yeah, same sort of action. Entry above the high, stop below the low, broadcast that up. That's gonna give you your initial profit target. Trail at that amount and hold on as long as you are not stopped out. ZS, yeah, it's another decent looking stock. It, it's a little extended longer term, as you can see. So in a case like this, I'd almost like to see a little bit more knockout move, but it looks pretty good. I think there's some other ones out there you could possibly go after. You just gave, you George, you just threw out a, a few good looking picks. There's a few that I would choose over this one. As a general statement, I, I prefer not going after something that's in such an extended longer term trend and such a higher price stock in this particular case. Doesn't mean I won't trade higher price stocks, but what's gonna happen is you're gonna probably need about a 15 point stop on this, or maybe even more. And so you'll wind up with about 150, 200 shares on a 100K account. And it could still make you pretty good money. I, I remember thinking with this uh, Chewy, it's like, ah, eh, it's higher price and I don't have that many shares on. But to my surprise, today notwithstanding, I didn't even look at today. <laughs> I have a bad habit of watching my equity all day. And that's where the F-bombs and bad moods come from and not following my plan from watching those flickering ticks too much. But I didn't even look at it today. But yeah, even a couple hundred shares, you get hit eight points. That's what, that's a lot, $1,600. So yeah, a tiny bit more pullback, not too much. You don't wanna see it come all the way back to this base in here or this prior high, I should say, like right there. But I think you, I think there's other ones out there that look just as good or better. Run for Donald. Yeah, that looks good too. And that is a semiconductor. It needs a little bit more pullback though, okay? So I told my clients tonight, that there's a lot of runs out there, a lot of stocks look like this with the overall market knocking out. And I don't want to clutter up the Landry list any more than it was with a bunch of other, other stocks. But maybe if it pulled back a few more points, it needs a little bit more knockout. You're welcome, George. I have to say that the caliber of the stock picks has gone through the roof. We've got a lot of good folks, <laughs> off the joke. He's not going to be here because I ran him off inadvertently. Ooh, you never, ever, you never like my stock picks. I was like, start picking better stocks. Yeah, I like this one. I remember this one from back in the day. I hope we made money on it. I know I played the original breakout way back here, and I hope we made money in the service on it. I don't remember whether we did or not. It's all a blur. But yeah, this looks pretty good. Almost could use a tiny bit of pullback, but it could probably be traded as it is. This one did catch my eye tonight. I like the fact that it broke out of this base. I like the nice accelerated move higher. And then I love these knockout moves that are occurring. Now, you know, if this market implodes, I'm going to be bummed out, okay? It's like, I want some correction, but I don't want it to hurt too bad. But I want it to hurt enough, I hate to say hurt other people, but hurt enough to where it shakes out the weak hands a little bit. BJ for Stewart. 
Yeah, this looks okay. Um, it just seems like it looks okay. It just seems like it kind of lost a little steam pulling back to here. But yeah, you could certainly find much worse. But yeah, that that's okay. That's not bad. Okay, I think we're pretty much have everybody. Any more? While we're at impasse, obviously I want to thank all you guys and girls for attending tonight. Looks like we brought, broke a new Thursday night record. We need to get back to like to the old shows where I was worried about having to buy a new account because we were running out of room, but uh, we need to work. It looks like everybody's finding it now, so that's a good thing. I, I guess asking you here, anybody watching the video not able to find it, usually on Thursdays at DaveLander.com, I'll have the link up. And then on other days, if you scroll down the homepage, you should be able to find it. All right, rock on, Dave. Thank you, George. You rock on too. Party on, party on, Garth. <laughs> be excellent. What is the uh, be excellent to each other? And party on, dude. All right, everybody have a great night. I really appreciate. It. Hey, down under, check it in. Barry from Australia. Thank you. Appreciate it. Everybody have a great night. Any unanswered questions? Bring them up in the Facebook group, and we'll take a look at them there. Thank you guys so much. See you again next week.